Good afternoon. Before we stand, it is so good to see each and every one of you today, and I'm so glad you're here. Kids need Kiwanis, and Kiwanis needs you. I do have one fun, actually I actually have two fun facts. Um, they're North Carolina fun facts. We'll see who can answer those first. Who? I always read the question wrong. I'm glad I'm not on Jeopardy because I would never answer it correctly. Who was the first professional that hit his first home run in Fayetteville, North Carolina in 1914? All right, well, that was quick. The second one that I have today, make sure I read the question right. What is the largest private home in the United States that has over 250. Okay, you guys are on top of it. So happy spring. I'm so happy to see you. If we will stand for our defining statement. Kiwanis is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to improving the world one child and one community at a time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Clay, if you will share us and lead us in song today. In your... Oh, Clay, I heard we had a soloist in the crowd. I think his really? name is Tim, and we'll learn more about Tim later. Okay, Clay. <laughs> well, as long as he can sing the right song. Uh, go to page 11 in the book, and it's number 27, and it's called America. And we will uh, go with a pitch of my, 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 my country, tis of the sweet land of liberty, loudly I sing, and where my father's Thank you, and a big thanks for Buck for covering for me. It's good to be back. Bill, if you'll lead us in our invocation. Let's pray. <clears throat> Today we come to you, Lord, with mixed emotions. We welcome the rain and we welcome the sun. We have plenty of good food to thank you for, along with thanking every hand or machine that has touched it, from the field to the processing houses to the cooking kitchens to delivery. We're grateful for our fellow Kiwanians who are working to improve the lives of every child no matter what their race, socioeconomic status, or zip code happens to be. We pray for those who aren't here because of health care challenges or depression due to deaths, illnesses, and or problems in the workplace. We pray that we could welcome them back soon. And yes, Lord, we pray for the reduction in the deadly gunfire, which is now happening on a daily basis either as a mass shooting of precious school children or as employees in a business situation. Too often, many of us have said there's no solution to gun violence because the criminals will always figure out a way to get guns. However, it's time to remember that our doing little or nothing is simply not working. It's more and more innocents are being shot to death. Help us to bring both sides of this emotional debate to the negotiating table before more lives are lost. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your faithfulness and for your grace. Amen. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Buck, will you introduce our guest and membership development? Fantastic. Let me take membership welfare first. Uh, first of all, let me... Uh, introduce Dick Hygert and let him stand up. He had surgery last Thursday on his hip and he's only bringing that in case somebody kicks him. <laughs> and he's already dancing. All right. We're glad to see that. Now, uh, do you have a guest today? Okay. Stand up, Tim. Uh, folks, this is Tim Longest. 
he may be your legislator if you live around Cameron Village or the Village District or you live around Five Points, North Hills, or on out toward 540, this is your uh, representative in the North Carolina House of Representatives. He uh, grew up in Greenville. He's the son of a doctor and a teacher. Uh, he's a lawyer, so you know that's good. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, let's see, the committees he's on, uh, Marine Resources, universities, finance, homeland security, fits right in with the uh, invocation. Uh, maybe there's no hope we can finally get something done about it, but welcome Kim Long. Thank you and welcome. We appreciate you being with us today. We also have Art Raymond back today and I'm gonna let Art introduce his guest. So I'm Art Raymond, I've been a member of the club for about uh, seven years or so. It's been a good, good opportunity to meet people in Raleigh. I've traveled a lot in business and I'm still called Raleigh home. This is my wife, Kathy. Kathy is a Broughton High School graduate of 67. Uh, uh, she is also the uh, Chief Administrator of the Broughton Alumni Committee, for when she puts in a lot of hours. And we have a son, he's a principal at uh, uh, high school in, in Rico County, Virginia, and two grandchildren, and we love them very much. Thanks for having me. I'll uh, keep you posted as to how I progress from here, but thank you again for taking me in. Thank you. Go Caps. We're glad to have him back, and Kathy, we really welcome you today being with him as, a, as our guest. Everybody, please say hello to our guest. Are there any other guests here? Yes, on the website, we have... I see Jeff is with us today. I hadn't, we hadn't seen Jeff in a while. And we have Beverly, Lori Cole, welcome. We are glad to have you. I'm sorry I could not see that. And we also have our birthdays that are uh, in the near future or the near past from what today is. You see them highlighted on the screen. We wish each of those people happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few announcements. Um, Sandra, will you share an update on the diaper drive? Thanks to everybody who donated to the diaper drive this year in May. We collected $3,125, and that purchased 7,500 diapers for children in the area. So thank you so much. You can continue to give to um, the diaper train on their website. Thank you. And while you have the mic, can we just make the announcement? I'm going to make the announcement that we have our annual meeting May 5th, and Sandra, as chair of the nominations committee, will present us a slate Great. next week. Thank you. The Kiwanis Board met last Tuesday, and if you're a new member and you want to get rid of that red part on your name tag, there's a checklist, and so you can always attend a board meeting. They're always the second Tuesday of the month at John Collar's office. We'd love to have you as well as you greet a few, three times and you get involved in other projects. However, we, we did approve two new members and Lucy and Hunter, are Lucy and Hunter here? Lucy and Hunter are not here. They're going through orientation this coming up Thursday night and they'll be inducted next week. So we will welcome them next week. Alice Garland, do you need a microphone? About the charter night. Uh, so first I wanna uh, remind you that one of the reasons that we changed the meeting time uh, from February to April is to try to get us closer to our actual charter date, uh, which is uh, the 2nd of April, um, the 8th, 8th of, it, 8th four, of April. Four, eight, yeah. Yeah, four, eight, yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so, we're, so we'll be very close to our actual charter date. Uh, it should be a lovely evening, uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, it's a very good location. Last year, everybody raved about the food. Uh, so it should, just, it should be a great evening. I will tell you that sign up is not as robust as we would like for it to be. So that I hope that if you've not signed up, you will give it some thought and uh, join us that evening. Thanks. Thank you, Alice. And Courtney had an announcement. Along with that, um, new members, Anybody that's joined since last charter night, you will be recognized. So try to, to come so that we can put a face with a name. Um, okay, I, one thing, part of the announcements. 
Rocky Strickland, who is one of our members and is online on Zoom, um, I think his goal is to watch every movie ever made at any time. But if you ever need a recommendation on a movie, Rocky is your go-to. But he let me know this week you happen to be watching a movie on Amazon Prime and thought that we might be interested in seeing a clip from it. See if you recognize the face. Tom Badger. Tom was a, a longtime member of our club and moved down to Alabama, and it just so happens his, I think, son-in-law is in the movie business, and Rocky saw it and thought, oh my goodness, and confirmed it and everything, but that, that was a nice little surprise. Um, the name of the movie, in case you are interested in pulling it up yourself, is called The Map of Tiny Perfect Things. It was from 2021. Um, one thing real quick while I have the mic too, so at our annual meeting, don't forget that's when we present Legion of Honor and Perfect Attendance, and I need help because with Zoom and everything, it is just really impossible for me to be able to keep track of everybody's attendance. So if you think you have, or you know that you have, perfect attendance from, now you gotta put on your thinking cap, it would be October 1st of 2021 to September 30 of 2022, yes. So it's almost like a year ago, but. So please let me know that so that I can get everything prepared and keep track of my records. Um, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you for all that you do to keep us straight every day and, and for the website development. Um, Andy Wood. And so real quick, just remember that the golf tournament's coming up on May the 4th. It's a Thursday in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to hang around afterwards for a few minutes if anybody has any questions or comments or whatever. I've got some registration forms as well, too just so that way I can pass them out if you haven't printed one off or whatnot. Um, if you're gonna sponsor, kind of the main thing is, is if you're gonna sponsor a team or a whole and you're gonna need a sign, if you've not done it in the past or if your logo has changed, please get with me because I need to try to get that, final, that piece finalized by next Friday to give, me, um, to give them enough time to print the sign, okay? So just catch up with me if you wanna play, if you wanna volunteer, let me know. I'll be around afterwards, um, that's it, thanks. Okay, and um, they're also, I actually put those golf forms on the, each of the tables too, Andy. And Travis, Travis has an announcement. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. If you'll see on your tables, we now have sign-up forms for the Miracle League event, which is on May 13th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, last year, this was a great turnout, and we all had a great time. We need, uh, we've committed 15 to 20 volunteers. Uh, it's in North Raleigh. Um, you can sign up here at the meeting or you can do it online or on the website. So uh, please sign up for that whenever you get a chance. Again, May 13th, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thank you. Yeah, a great time was had. So please sign up and join us for some fun. And now I'd like to call on Bob Goodell to introduce our speaker today. Fellow Kalanians, how many of you have ever heard of healing transitions? A handful. Thanks. I lived my life in such a way that I never expected to live to be 40. Yet here I am at 44. <laughs> I really did live my life that way as though I never expected to live to be 40, but thank God, uh, I, um, folks like you that cared about folks like me, I, uh, um, I stopped drinking uh, 51 years ago. Otherwise, I guarantee you. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably have been here at, uh, at 44. I'm really enthusiastic about healing transitions. 
It's an amazing, amazing place with a, men, with a men's campus on Lake Wheeler Road, just uh, this side of the tracks, and uh, a women's campus uh, near Olmstead Park, uh, out if you take a left at Carmax off Glenwood. It's about a quarter mile from there. And uh, so last night, uh, I, about 150 men in, in, in the men's campus and 99 on the women's campus backed up with, with a um, just drop in shelter and you can come in wet or, or high of about, uh, of about 75 and a detox of about 26 on men's. So hundreds of people are served here and that's gonna go up because of a $23 million capital campaign. You'll see the ground is broken if you go out Lake Wheeler Road. That will increase that capacity to 300 men and 150 women, not including the detox and not including the drop in shelter. It's an amazing thing that started here in, in 2000. And um, um, so 2001, I love it. I came from, I came here from there this morning. I'm there many days because I see the avalanche of miracles and I'm one of them. And here, so today we're privileged to have Tracy William Hines, who uh, is director of women's services. She served as a planning room supervisor. She can, you know, she's, she's been at this since 2014 and is alumnus of the program, as are 87% of the 72 people who work there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tracy Freeman Hines and her associate, <laughs> Mr. Billings. Let's give me a warm welcome. Hey, everybody. Thank you um, for inviting us out here to speak. Um, as Bob just earlier stated, my name is Tracy Freeman Hines. I'm the director of recovery services at our women's campus. I've been. Um, working for Healing Transitions since 2014. Um, I'm also an alumni of, our, um, of that program, um, which means I am a person in long-term recovery. I have a little bit over 11 years of sobriety uh, um, and successful recovery. Um, my passion for working there comes from my own lived experience with being homeless, suffering from substance use disorder, uh, recovering from childhood trauma, and I'm, I'm so very grateful that there was a place for me to go here in Wake County. Um, just to tell you a little bit um, about Healing Transitions, how it, it came to be, um, back in 1997, there was a, a gap analysis conducted to identify that that there were probably almost close to 2,000 homeless individuals and 65% of those individuals suffered, suffered from substance use disorder. Wake County decided to come together to kind of solve that problem because um, what was happening, the homeless individuals with substance use disorders were being cared for by first responders, emergency, um, emergency departments, and would end up in Wake County Jail, um, causing you know definitely an issue with that. Um, so some folks went up to Kentucky, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, to check out this uh, program there called the Healing Place and realized this is exactly what we needed here in Wake County. And, and there in Louisville, um, they, they had a wet shelter, Bob kind of stated. Um, uh, let me back up. So currently, back in 1997, there were shelters that served homeless individuals. Unfortunately, if you were under the influence, they would turn you away. And so what was needed here in Wake County was a shelter um, that homeless people could go to um, that uh, would be also able to, you know, be able to get services for substance use. Um, so that program came to Wake County. Uh, Fred Barber, Maria uh, Spalding, and Barbara Goodman were the founders of the program here in Wake County. Um, they worked in, endlessly, tirelessly to, to get the program started. Um, as Bob stated, in 2001, the men's campus opened. In 2006, the women's campus opened. Um, the women's campus was designed um, to serve about 88 people. The men's campus was des uh, designed to serve about 165 people. Since that time, the population um, in Wake County has increased tremendously, which also means that the homeless population um, um, has increased as well. 
Um, our philosophy at uh, Healing Transitions, formerly known as Healing Place of Wake County, is that we, we, we pride ourselves in having services on demand. When COVID hit, um, it really threatened our ability to be able to serve um, the people that needed help um, right away. When an individual is reaching out for help who suffers from substance use disorder, to, makes a decision to say, hey, I want help. We always want to make sure that we have a bed for them, that we have services for them, that we have resources for them. And, 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 and putting um, the inability to say, no, we can't do it right now, or no, our, our doors are closed, really is a detriment to those individuals reaching out for help. Um, so during COVID, um, we, we, we struggled. Um, the men's campus had to shut down their overnight shelter. We had so many men and women sleeping on mats on the floors, um, and there were people looking for help. Um, there was a capital campaign that took place that helped us um, get the funds to be able to expand both facilities. And as Bob stated, we are we have broken ground at the women's campus. We're looking at um, adding an admin building, expanding our kitchen, adding um, additional beds to our shelter, bathroom facilities, things of that nature. At the men's campus, um, we're gonna be expanding our kitchen, um, adding additional beds as well and a vocational building. And so we, we're looking forward to being able to serve more people who need the help. Um, Healing Transitions has specific um, services um, that, are, that are beautiful. It's not enough just to come in and get a bed and. Um, a safe place to be, but we also want to add some services that's going to help individuals be able to be successful. Um, we do have a non medical detox uh, center at the women's campus, we have 10 beds available available for individuals who just need to um, have a safe place to detox um, is a social uh, social uh, detox, which means we have current participants that come in and interact with those individuals to kind of motivate them and engage them in, into participating in the program. If they're not interested in participating at Healing Transitions, we, um, we assist them in um, looking for other services. We have an overnight emergency shelter. Um, Bob stated it's wet, which means you can come in under the influence um, and have a safe place to be and, and hopefully we can get you the services that you need if you're interested in recovery in the recovery program. Our, our biggest resource is the long term recovery program, which is about 12 to 18 months long. Um, that's the part of the program that I supervise over at the women's campus is broken down into three sections. We have um, motivation and engagement track. We have CTR1, which stands for commit to recovery. And then we have CTR2, which is the transitional part of the program. Um, it, it takes about 12 to 18 months um, to get through that whole process. And while they're there, they're responsible for attending classes. Um, going to 12 step meetings, getting a sponsor, um, in addition to getting the, the much needed support that they need in other areas. Um, we have a healthcare clinic um, in case individuals are needing um, to get back on medications, getting connected to mental health services, things of that nature. Um, we have a transitional case manager. Once you get to CTR2, we work with the individual um, to connect them to jobs. Um, helping with resumes, um, learning how to budget. Um, we also have a child and family service um, department, um, individuals who may have um, uh, uh, interaction with uh, DSS, um, things of that nature. We, uh, we, we have a staff here that helps navigate that process in hopes that we can reunite the mother with their child or, or vice versa, family with the child. Or, I'm sorry, the father with the child. We also have a um, rapid responder program, and this is something that is a little bit new, but um, individuals in Wake County that have um, experienced an overdose um, end up on a list, and uh, these peer support specialists are able to uh, contact those folks to see what other resources that they need, hopefully connect them to services. Um, they help with harm reduction, linkage to services, transportation to clinics to go dose, um, and also peer support. 
Um, in addition, we have a recovery outreach program, um, individuals that um, reach out to um, either participants that leave the program before finishing or um, individuals that actually complete the program. We want to make sure that, you know, you're doing well. What is it that we can do to assist you so you can um, stay, uh, uh, maintain your recovery and stay engaged with us? <clears throat> Guiding principles for healing transitions is, uh, as we I stated earlier, um, you do not have to be uh, sober um, to engage in our program, um, which means we have a low threshold for engagement. There is absolutely no cost to the participant. Um, however, it does cost $55 a day for any one individual to receive services. Um, we believe in services as demand, on demand, which means it's really important that we keep our doors open because we are a, um, a great service to the community. Um, we believe in as many times as it takes. I've been in recovery programs in the past, um, and once you go, uh, I've had the experience of um, engaging in a program, having a return to use, and being told you can't come back. Um, and there wasn't a lot of services available. Um, and it's a peer to peer approach like the, the unique thing about our program is that we the participants actually have a huge um, responsibility in the operation of the program, um, we believe in uh, peer support, meaning you know. Uh, someone that's in CTR2 in the last part of the program is able to reach back to someone who's in CTR1 and kind of share their experience, strength and hope to help them through the program and stay in recovery. Um, and we also believe in linkage to the recovery community. Um, so we, we really encourage 12 step, we encourage any, any pathway to recovery that's gonna improve someone's quality of life. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, since 2001, the, the population of Wake County has uh, increased. Um, we talked, I just kind of shared about um, our expansion, the need, uh, the men's design capacity was 165 in January 11, 20, uh, 2020, we served 241 people uh, at the men's campus. The de uh, design capacity for the women's campus um, is 88. February 18, 2020, we were serving by, uh, 153 people. Um, and so the need is very, very great. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time um, because I do, I feel like it's important to actually hear um, the experience um, of an individual that has actually been in the program. Um, and so I wanna go ahead and introduce Ms. Crystal Billings. Uh, she is a current um, participant in our program, um, participating in a transitional part of the program. She's also a peer mentor. A uh, peer mentor is an individual um, that is doing a service commitment. Um, they are responsible for teaching the curriculum that we have um, at Healing Transitions. So I'll let her kind of share a little bit about her story and what Healing Transitions has done for her. Thank you. Hey y'all, I'm Crystal. Um, I am currently, like she said, in the last phase of the program, so CTR2. Um, it has not been easy for me, but this place taught me how to love myself again. They made sure to love me until I learned to love myself again. Um, like Tracy said, it's a 12 to 18 month program. I was not one of those that sailed through it. Um, I stumbled a few times, but I was never judged and I was never turned away. I did have a couple return to uses in the beginning, but once I got it, I got it. Um, I had a great childhood. My parents, I come from a broken home, but I had step parents on both sides. I just, I had a great childhood. I was spoiled, double the fun, double the presents, double the holidays. I have no childhood trauma to blame my addiction on. Um, both of my parents, remarried the same year, they had children the same year, they also divorced the same year. And I believe that's when I started using because they had so much going on, I was just kind of left to myself, to my own devices. I was 16, um, I had no structure pretty much, I could do what I wanted and that's what started my long road of addiction. Um, it was mainly to fit in. I did the things that I did to 
fit in, numb the way that I felt. Um, it's not that I didn't feel loved or anything. I just didn't really feel like I had a belonging anywhere. Once my parents had split up, you know, I bounced back and forth. Um, I then got into um, an accident. My back got broken. That started my opiate addiction. And that's where everything really went downhill. I was in my early 20s. That's when, um, you know, the abusive relationships, everything, it was just a roller coaster of events. And before I know, knew it, 10 years had gone by. 15 years had gone by. So I've been in my addiction now since I was 16. I'm 40. I've been um, at Healing Transitions for right at a year. Next month makes a year. And in that one year, I have learned more about myself than I have in the other 39 years, um, being sober, being clean. A lot of the staff that works there also went through the program, like Miss Tracy. And I remember when I first got there, it was, I would look at them or I'd hear their stories, I'd see their success, and I wanted what they had. Um, so if they could do it, I could do it. Uh, the family systems coordinator, the woman she talked about, I remember when she came through the program, we worked together um, years ago at a restaurant. I seen her complete the program. I saw her get her kids back. Years go down, you know, go by. And then I get to the program and she's the family services coordinator. And so, I mean, it's just crazy how it makes a full circle. Um, my rock bottom, it's funny how God works, but uh, I was homeless. I was living in a tent and I was content with that. That's how bad my addiction had me. I have um, a son who's almost four. My mom had him at the time. He didn't know anything except for his mom was gone. So, you know, this disease is impacting more than just the addict. It's, it's impacting families. It's very traumatic for them too. And I didn't realize that until I got clean and sober. But um, so I got in some legal trouble. I got caught with some drugs and I went to jail. And my brother had been to Healing Transitions. He did not complete the program, but he told my family about it. They told me about it. And the judge wanted me in some kind of long-term treatment. So I suggested heal and transitions. He was trying to send me somewhere else, but I would have had to sit there in jail for many months waiting for a bed. So I didn't know anything about this place except for my brother said, go there, you know, it'll help you. And I didn't know it was so long of a program. When I heard that, it kind of freaked me out, but it worked out in my favor. Um, so the judge was like, okay, great. You know, that's what you need to do. So I went there, I mandated there. I, I mean, I could leave if I wanted to, you know, go do 90 days in jail, no big deal for someone like me who's used to that. And um, I said, well, I'm gonna try something different. Well, I did it. I did what was asked of me for probation for the temporary custody thing with my mom having my son, all of that's complete and I'm still there. Um, if I were to walk out today, it would be okay. I wouldn't be in any trouble. Everything would go good with my custody, but I want to give back what was so freely given to me. So that's why I chose to do my commitment as a peer mentor. And like Tracy was saying, reach back and help that next person because I remember how broken I was when I come in this place. I was such a broken soul, y'all. Like I couldn't even look in the mirror. Um, the picture I have around my neck is what I look like the day I walked in. Looks like two totally different people. I've seen this program change so many people's lives. It's, it's pretty um, profound. I would recommend it to anyone. Um, I should be hoping to transition out, you know, by the end of the summer. I'm not rushing it, but I know that forever because of the connections I've made through this place, if I need something, they will be there to help me. They have taught me um, about my disease, the solution for my disease, and um, just, I mean, basically how to love myself again. And I never, ever, ever had the confidence that I have now. And I just, and me and my son, we are closer than we've ever been. Me and my mother, we're closer than we've ever been. And those are two relationships I didn't think would ever repair because it was hanging on by a thread. I mean, she it had gotten to the point she wouldn't answer the phone for me. She would not let me cross the threshold of her door to see him um, because I was so bad off. Now I see him 
very often. Um, she trusts me to go in her house. She trusts me with her house keys. She trusts me driving her car. It's just a huge turnaround and I, I owe it all to Healing Transitions. They help save my life and anything I can do to help the next sick and suffering, I will. So thank you guys for having me. I think we have a, a few minutes to answer any questions. Um, before we get started with that, um, I had someone um, put a, a brochure on some of the tables attached with my card. If you are looking for um, a better overview of the program, um, that's in the brochure. Um, if you have any questions that you have, um, other questions, additional questions that you have, um, just my card is attached to the brochure. You can give me a call, um, but we can open it for, for questions. What is the di primary difference, if there is one, between the women's program and the men's program? Um, we, there, there's not a difference. Um, we use the same curriculum. Um, the men's uh, uh, facility has definitely more people um, than the women's campus, but it's the same curriculum, same program, um, same social model of recovery. Um, the men's campus is just uh, serves more uh, individuals than the women's campus. So where do you, tell me about where you get the money, <clears throat> how much money is it, and how many people do you need to be serving? Um, so I don't know the numbers, but I can tell you um, that we, we have fundings that come from, well, one of our biggest funder uh, is the ABC board. Um, we do have uh, funding that comes from city um, in, in state, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I don't know the specifics. Bob may be able to tell you more about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, but I want to make a suggestion to share with the other members. When my wife died, I didn't know what to do with her clothes. And so I called around different places. And when I called Healing Transitions, I was told that y'all needed clothes because one of their programs, I guess it's still a part, is to go out on job interviews. And they said a number of the women who live there or were staying there didn't have clothes that were appropriate to go out on job interviews. So. I got more out of giving those clothes to healing transitions than y'all did probably, but uh, I just would encourage any of you, if you're in a situation for men's clothes or women's clothes to give away that, that you, this is a wonderful organization uh, and anybody, any group that can help Bob Goodell make something out of himself is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it deserves all the help they can get. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes, if you have uh, donations for clothing, I think we also take furniture, things of that nature. Um, we we take everything. Um, please feel free to to drop it off. Um, if you need somebody to pick up some stuff, um, contact us and we can schedule a pickup as well. Yes, sir. I, I'm a uh, lawyer. Unblock, don't tell me. I know. Don't tell me. But uh, one of the programs that we have to go through is. Uh, is to, we have to go to get seminars from uh, places like yours. So I have been to your women's program mm -hmm. and I have been to your men's program. It was it was so good I went twice, you know, <laughs> which parlays into the what I heard one of the last times is that the, one of the main differences from your group is that, and you've mentioned it several times here, is that when people fail, you don't kick them out. And I just remember one guy said, no, no, no. There is no such thing as total failure. Mm -hmm. he said we had one 18 times he flunked. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he passed. Mm -hmm. And he's still sober today. So perseverance must be a cornerstone of, of your program. And uh, so thank you very much. Congratulations. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to answer that, uh, add to the question about what's the difference between the men's and the women's program? One's for men and one's for women's. <laughs> and there's a big difference between the two programs. For example, uh, uh, the child custody issue. Many of the women who are there have lost custody of their children. But it helps, it does help in both places. It helps uh, the men become, you know, re-engaged with their family 
with their children. You just hear it all the time. So uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, and, and, and this, this bit about as many times as it takes, uh, I sponsor folks. And one of the individuals that I sponsor uh, was in and out of detox 56 times. And he's been clean for um, almost two years, going on two years. Amazing story. He's, and so it's just uh, an example of that. About half the participants are re about half the participants are retrackers. That's what we call them, retrackers. So, uh, but it's it's uh, it's saving lives unbelievably. The loss to overdoses is amazing. I'm uh, Tracy mentioned the rapid responder program. I've ridden with the. Uh, with a van there, and it's I can can I can't explain to you how grateful I am to be able to experience going into the tent communities and hearing the folks, and you know it's a harm reduction program, so uh, it's something else. If anybody ever wants to take a tour, give me a call. It will change your life. I guarantee it. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, question. There, thank you for what you do. There are lots of other organizations in our city that do similar, like a Step Up and the Men and and, and uh, Salvation Army and the Rescue Mission. Do you, do you work with these people? How how is that interaction? Um, we, as community partners, we try not to work in a silo. And so, when individuals are needing maybe different services or maybe healing transitions is not for them um, or they choose a different course, you know, um, we try to work with other community partners to make sure um, that they don't fall through the cracks. Um, our, our program is a little bit different than some of the other homeless services, being that is, is a social model of recovery, um, is a peer to peer um, aspect to the program, meaning um, participants are actually helping each other kind of recover. Um, we don't have a lot of staff that's going to, you know, like a clinical, um, a clinical uh, facility where you have therapists and doctors, things of that nature that kind of manage a treatment plan. Our, our program is, is peer to peer where participants are actually helping each other through that recovery process. And, and we definitely do um, work with other community partners um, to make sure we're not duplicating services and also to make sure folks aren't falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Crystal, thank you for sharing your story. Good luck. And we were behind you. And thank you for giving back. And thank you so much for being with us and sharing. We donate a book to the classrooms. Um, and so we're going to ask you to sign it. And we'll donate it in honor of you for speaking with us today. And there is a tag in there. So if you will sign it right there, that would be fantastic. And we need a pen. <laughs> well, I have a pen. Sorry. Thank you very much. Nick will bring us a pen. Um, I want to welcome Tracy and Crystal. Hope you'll come back and join us again. Tim, please come and we won't ask you to do the solo. Um, Kathy and Lori, please come and be with us again. Um, we are going, before we close, we're going to, Lori Brummel's going to, I mean, Laura Brummel's going to join me at the front. She's going to, thank you very much. She's going to read us a memorial resolution um, for Lawrence Shooting. And then we'll close with a silent, a moment of silence. First, I want to say you ladies are amazing. That was just wonderful. Um, I'm here to talk about my dearest, oldest friend, Lawrence Shooping Sr. Lawrence Bruner Shooping Jr. He was the son of Lawrence Bruner Shooping Sr. and Grace Gladys Johnson. He was born on August the 1st, 1946 in Raleigh and died March the 20th of two, <clears throat> 2021 at the age of 74. Um, Lawrence graduated from Parsons College with a BA degree and uh, went to the University of Oklahoma where he got his law degree. He entered private practice in Raleigh for five years, served as Deputy Commissioner of the North Carolina Industrial Commission for 20 years, and then became a workers' compensation mediator for 20 years. 
During his time in private practice, he met the love of his life, Jean Lanier Leggett, and they were married in 1976. Lawrence was a man of strong faith, a member of Christ Church, the Sphinx Club, the Carolina Country Club, the 2500 Club, and other community organizations. He lived life to the fullest and was known for his love of laughter and dry sense of humor, and that's the truth. He was an excellent cook and an avid reader. Uh, Lawrence was predeceased by his wife, Jean. He's survived by his son, Alexander Shooping, and his partner, Sarah. Uh, they were of Raleigh, but now they live in Charleston. His stepdaughter, Jean Dada, and her husband, Al, who was from Nags Head, and his deceased stepdaughter, Elizabeth Evans of Nags Head. He had five grandchildren and several other family members. And Lawrence joined the Kiwanis Club in 1982 and was an active, dependable, and valued member for 39 years. He received the George F. Hickson Fellowship Award. Um, Lawrence was a loving family man who opened his heart and offered sound advice and counsel to his friends, to his children, and to his grandchildren, and to the members of the Kiwanis Club of Raleigh who recognized him as a suitable role model for any citizen who seeks to make a positive impression among his family and to leave his community a better place than he found it. Um, the Qantas Club of Raleigh desires to recognize, honor, and emulate the life of Lawrence Bruner Shooping Jr. and the quality of the relationships he built. It is therefore resolved that the Kiwanis Club of Raleigh, North Carolina, here by memorializes the life of a loyal member, Lawrence Bruner Shipping Jr., celebrates his career and commends to all a life well lived and a demonstrated dedication to his family, friends, and to his church and his community. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread upon the minutes of the Kiwanis Club of Raleigh. Be it finally resolved that a copy of this resolution be provided to the Shipping family as an expression of the affection and respect of the Kiwanis Club for its member, Lawrence Bruner Shipping Jr. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 We will close in a moment of silence. <clears throat> Have a great day. She may raise it.